house of the Lord among the people of God that strengthens us uh, for this life's journey. Amen. Amen. Before I start on tonight, it's certainly so good to see everyone on today. And um, it appears to me in my mind right now that it is Administrative Assistant Day. Those who uh, work in administration in the offices. And I just want to take the time right now to say a very special thank you to Sister Boatwright and to Sister Emma Brooks and um, to uh, Sister Betty Lazard as well, amen, uh, for your prudent and consistent work in the church office. And you can expect some donuts a little bit later. Uh, drop them by uh, for you. But we appreciate you. Appreciate all that you do. And um, I appreciate everyone that's here, those who are watching virtually. So good to see the Womack family back and um, certainly praying for. Uh, amen. Uh, Sister Williams and her family traveling. Uh, to uh, be with uh, their family as they mourn the loss of their brother. I'm excited on tonight. I'm excited about what we talked about last week. Last week, we saw a glimpse of glory, and we have the same handouts um, from last week. If you still have yours from last week, we're going to continue in that. And what we saw on last week is a glimpse of the throne room of heaven a glimpse of the throne room of heaven, and um, that glimpse we found in Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4, and we want to continue with that. I'm going to go back uh, through and review what, what we looked at, and then we're going to continue in the symbolism that we see there and look to uh, merge it all together with the biblical record. Because God is good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. I want to say while it's on my mind as well, um, we know that on the past few Sundays there were gatherings that were taking place in the afternoons in Webster Park, and uh, people do have the right to gather in a positive and peaceful way. And um, I want to highlight and commend one of our, our members uh, who took the initiative, the Holy Ghost initiative, uh, to stand in one of the church's parking lots. And when he was standing, he wasn't standing empty-handed. But he was standing with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everyone who came through that parking lot, he greeted them uh, with the love of Jesus Christ as well as um, the gospel message by way of tracts and by way of witnessing. And he just walked in the door. And I, I just want to acknowledge him. Brother Marius Link, would you stand and wave your hand? Amen. Can you... Praise God. Praise God. It didn't, it didn't, have, it didn't tell him to do it. I just, they said, Marius is up here. He's sharing the gospel. And I told him, you're the GOAT. <laughs> Stands for greatest of all time. And so I was very excited about that. So let's, let's look at Revelation chapter 4. Uh, this is apocalyptic literature, highly symbolic, um, what the theologians call eschatology. And we're looking at the study of future events. And I'm going to go ahead and read the entire chapter again, Revelation chapter 4, 11 verses, and then we'll go as far as the Holy Spirit will allow us to go on tonight. Verse number 1 says, After these things I look, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. He who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes, 
in front and behind. First creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, 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 is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Amen. Amen. I think I'll start on this, this evening the same way I started on last week. And I want to ask you the question, what comes to your mind when you think of heaven? What comes to your mind when you think of heaven? And those who are watching virtually, if you type in your answer. Peace. No confusion. Peace. Love. All right. Land of no more. No more what? All right. No more pain. No more heartache. Angels. Someone said they think of angels. All right. Praising the Lord all day. And I like the way you said that. You didn't say all day and all night. Because it says no night there. And no need of the sun because the lamb is the, is, is the, the radiance, the, the light there. What else? Beauty. Oh, it's almost indescribable beauty when we look at how Ezekiel tried to describe it and how John and even Isaiah tried to describe this throne. What else? Eternal life. Prayer. Prayer. That's a good one. All right, somebody say, wondering if you're going to make it. Can you be sure you're going? You ought to know. All right. Who's the door? We say you saw a door. Christ is the door. All right. What else? What about loved ones? <laughs> somebody said no. <laughs> Some people have <laughs> Well, there, there. Yeah, all right, there, there, are, there are some loved ones who have gone on right before us who we believe are in Christ. What else? Say it again. All right. So last week when we looked at heaven and we saw some of these things that were present in this glimpse of glory that after the church is wrapped it up, we see this throne room of, of the Lord in heaven and we said that heaven is a place of grace. It is a place of grace. But no one will be able to walk around heaven saying they're there because of their own merit. Because of their own efforts. If everyone who goes to heaven has to go through what? Jesus Christ. He's the door. And he's the only door. He's the only door. And so we said it is a place of grace. And I want to say this on tonight. Um, it follows wherever there is grace, there will always be gratitude. Right? Anybody been saved by grace? You say it's God's grace. I don't deserve it. I couldn't earn it. God found me and he saved me so wherever there's grace when we know it wasn't us but it was God you can't help but tell them what thank you wherever there is grace there should always be gratitude and wherever gratitude is expressed there will always be glory to God when we know it was the grace of God we can't help but say thank you 
And by saying thank you, that doesn't give the glory to us, but it gives the glory to who? To God. We said that last week that heaven is a place of grace. So let's go ahead and look and just look at these emblems of grace in review. Verse number one, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. This is interesting because we can say on tonight, we didn't open the door, but God opened it. And, and because he opened it, we can't say or take credit for going to heaven. We got to give credit to the one who opened the door. And so we see that right there is grace in itself. But then he says, I heard a sound of a trumpet speaking with me I like the voice of the Lord. And it gave us that first point on the handout, the summons. God called him up, called him up. And we said on last week, if God calls you, you got to go. If he calls you, you've got to go. If he calls your name, a lot of times when we uh, loved ones go on to be with the Lord and we, we, we want them to be here with us, we want them, we want to enjoy them for as long as, as we can. But if they're in Christ, when God called their name, listen, that was a joyous time for them. That, that, was a, that was a time where they will finally be at rest from the labor and the turmoil and the confusion that we see in this world. And so we saw the summons. But we also see in, in review that there was a throne and one that was sitting on the throne. And we said that represents God's sovereignty. That was the second point. And he's in control. He's in control. That he's sitting on that throne. And when John saw that throne, the same way that Isaiah saw it in Isaiah chapter 6, Ezekiel saw it in Ezekiel chapter 1, that throne was high. That throne was lifted up. And that throne, according to John, he said the throne was standing. And to speak of it as standing, he's saying this throne is prominent and is also permanent. It's prominent when he looked in heaven the most prominent thing that he saw was the throne of God and then he says it was standing it's permanent and we said on last week there will never be a time where God is dethroned he will always and is always in control and so we saw this throne which represents the sovereignty and then number three we looked at the scene he said I was in the spirit Behold, a throne was standing in heaven, one sitting on the throne, and he, was, he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, these beautiful uh, materials. And then he said, there was what around the throne? A rainbow. Again, we see that heaven is a place of grace, which is why it will always be a place of continual gratitude and glory because whenever you see a rainbow based on what the Bible says about the rainbow, it means that God in his grace said he would never do what to the earth again? Flood it. He would never flood it again. And so whenever I see a rainbow and if you're walking around heaven, you, the song said walk around heaven all day, you can't walk around heaven without seeing that rainbow. And you can't see that rainbow without thinking about the fact that God was well within his rights to destroy all of us because all have what? Sin and come short of the glory of God. God could have stopped it right there. He would have been just. It said you sin, the wages of sin is death. That's it. But the gift of God is eternal life. Question, we said it on last week. How did Noah live to see that rainbow. What was it? The grace of God. The Bible said God looked over the entire earth. He said he, he, he felt bad. And, and he looked and he said it was only evil in man's heart continually. And then it just parenthetically says, but Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah wasn't the only one. You're saved on today. You found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so after he came out of the ark, God put the rainbow in the sky. The rainbow will still be uh, prominent in heaven around his throne, which lets us know, according to what Hebrews said, that we come boldly to a throne of what? Grace. It's his throne. We see the door open that we didn't open, but he opened for us. 
We see a rainbow letting us, reminding us that God could have destroyed us, but yet he saved us by grace through faith. What else do we see? We see around the throne, we see that rainbow and like an emerald in appearance. So not just the normal rainbow that you see on the Lucky Charms box. But this is like a rainbow that you'd never seen before. And, and you just get the feeling that uh, these writers, as they're moved along by the Holy Spirit, are doing their very best to describe almost an indescribable scene. He keeps saying it was like, it was like this. And so we see this rainbow like an emerald in appearance. And then we see around the throne, 24 thrones. And upon those thrones, 24 elders. We said that number 24 represents the 24 orders of the priesthood found in 1 Chronicles, the 24th chapter, which is an easy way to remember it. And these 24 elders are representative of the entire church. And we see that they're representative of the entire raptured church because they are uh, carrying characteristics of the overcomers from chapters 2 and 3. Remember, he said, he that overcomes... I will clothe in white garments. He said at another place, he that overcomes, I will make him to sit down with me in, in, in the throne as I've sat down in my father's throne. We talked about them having these crowns on their heads. And these crowns, according to the Greek word, were not the crown, the diadem that the king of kings wears, but these are crowns that you get for winning a race or, or, or competing in an athletic event and coming out victorious or overcoming. And we said, and we alluded back to when Paul said, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my course. And then he says, henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He said, it's not only for me, but for all those who love what? His appearing. His appearing. And so we see these in individuals, representative, uh, who are both priest and king, royalty and priesthood, with these crowns on their heads around the throne. Verse number five. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Anybody remember what that is an allusion to? There's this throne and there's, there's this mountain of God, this throne in heaven. And you see lightning and thunder coming out from it. All right. All right. So Israel at Mount Sinai. Now this thunder and lightning coming from this throne it, was that a pleasant experience for the children of God when they were when at Mount Sinai mm -mm. no as a matter of fact that mountain he said if, if a dog touch it he'll die if, if anybody comes too close he said only Moses can come up and, and Moses went up in that mountain and they heard that thunder and the voice of the Lord and it was so terrifying that they told Moses you Moses you just tell us we don't want the Lord to tell us but in Hebrews we saw last week that he said you hadn't come to that mountain but you come to Mount Zion and, 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 and you have come to a different mountain to where now the thunder is remind you of how holy God is but the good news is because of his grace you're able to approach him and so another reminder of the grace of God he said, there was a thunder, there were the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. How many Holy Ghosts are there? One. One. Seven spirits of God are referring to those seven characteristics of the spirit found in Isaiah 11 and 2. And so you see the spirit of God before the throne. And then we ended last week, there was something like a sea of glass. And he said it was like crystal. So you imagine all of these colors of the rainbow, all of these emerald uh, in, in this diamond-like uh, uh, metals all around this throne. You've got the radiance of God. You've got lightning. You have thunder. You you have these uh, uh, all of these saints around the throne, and then you have beneath all of this beauty, you have a sea of crystal 
reflecting all of this beauty and, and, and the, can you imagine the light from the rainbow and the light from the lamb that we'll see reflecting off of that crystal we've never seen beauty like that ever and he says it's a sea of glass as opposed to the sea that we are used to and we said in that, that he said in the, towards the end of Revelation there'll be no more sea in heaven because the sea is always restless a sea represents the unknown. A sea, sea represents that which can't be seen and, it, and it's dark. But a sea of glass, you can see. And a sea of glass is, is, is not un, unpredictable and, 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 and where you, where you can't, can't walk on it. But it's steady, it's stable. And so we see beneath all of that, that the throne is held up by that sea of crystal. Now, that's, that was in review. Now we come to where we left off. He said, and in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in the front and behind. Now, interestingly enough, and a lot of commentators do a good job to point this out. As he's describing this throne, the throne is the centerpiece and as he describes it, he describes it with preposition after preposition. And, and a preposition is just basically saying what's around or in or before. And so if you look, he says, come up here, I'll show you. And he said, there was something on the throne. That's the king. Then he says, there was something around the throne. That's the rainbow. He says there's also other things are people around the throne, the 24 thrones, and upon those, the 24 elders. Then he says there's something on the throne, there's something around the throne, and there's also something coming from the throne. The flashes of thunder and the flashes of lightning. Not only is there something on the throne, around the throne, coming from the throne, but there's something before the throne. And before the throne, it's the spirit of God. But when we get to these creatures, it says they are in the center and around the throne. These four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Verse number seven says the first creature was like a lion. The second creature like a calf. The third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. I want you to imagine if one of those walked in here right now. I beat y'all running out of here. What you got all them eyes for? This is not something you normally see. And, and I, I believe my wife and I were talking about it. Maybe this is why people would say they were afraid of revelation because you start seeing all that. We just have two eyes. There's somebody walking here with just two more than they supposed to have. Well, so we got glasses. I got my glasses, but 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 just this is this is abnormal. It's supernatural. It's it's, it's almost like something out of a sci-fi, but it's real. And sci-fi is just trying to imitate what what is real. Now, to get a better understanding. Of, of these four living creatures. Somebody say living creatures. Let's go to Ezekiel, the first chapter. Ezekiel, the first chapter. And I just want you to read with me. This, this really would teach itself. We read through it. Ezekiel, the first chapter and the fourth verse. Ezekiel also saw this throne thousands of years earlier. And in the fourth verse, I'm just going to read through them because the similarities are going to be amazing. He says, as I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it. And the mist was something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it, there were figures resembling how many? Four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces. This is interesting. He said each one had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like a calf's hoof. And they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under the wings on their four sides were human hands. So you got human hands, feet like an ox. 
As for the faces and the wings of the four of them, verse number nine, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn. When they moved, each went straight forward. As for the forms of the faces, each had the face of a man. All four, somebody say all four, had the face of a lion on the right, a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Now, let me just stop and say this now, because Ezekiel says, I saw four of them, and all four of them had four faces. Well, remember what Ezekiel said, wherever they went, they did not turn their faces. And so when John sees them, he sees each of them from one side. Let's keep going. He says, such were their faces, verse number 11. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covering their bodies. Twelve, each went straight forward. I like this. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. Verse number 13, in the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, and the lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Now, let's stop and say this at, at, at verse number 14. Revelation 4 says that these four living beings are covered with eyes and they are in and around the throne. These four living beings are darting back and forth as fast as lightning. You think Superman fast as lightning. They are darting back and forth as fast as lightning. So I want you to try to imagine this scene with all of this beauty, with this thunder, with all of these 24 elders, and we haven't even got to what everybody's saying, but all of this is going on, and these four living beings are going back and forth, and they see everything. And wherever the spirit goes, because remember, the spirit is before the throne, wherever the spirit is about to go. They are so in tune with the spirit that they are right there where the spirit goes. Now, let me just stop and say this. The Bible says, it teaches us to pray, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is willfully and completely. And if we want this, the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven, when we see where the spirit is going, we ought to be going that direction as well. Amen. Let's keep going. 15. Ezekiel 1 and 15, he says, Now as I look at the living beings, behold, there was one will on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel. All four of them had the same form, their appearance and workmanship being as if one will within another. You heard it, the will in the middle of what? Of the will. Wherever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. Verse number 18, it says, as for their rims. These are the first rims to ever be, be, be really, really the rims that people should have worn. You put rims on your car, but you can't get them like this. He says, as for their rims, they were lofty and awesome, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. And whenever the living beings move, the wheels move with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close beside them for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever those went, these went, and whenever those stood still, these stood still, and whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, and it repeats it, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Now, these four living beings, and we're going to say a lot about them, there's so much to say about them, and it's what really we wanted, I wanted to come to on tonight. It says that these wheels that are carrying these four living beings and the wheels are full of eyes the living beings are full of eyes it says the wheels touch the earth 
The living beings are situated in heaven. As a matter of fact, I think this is a good place to say that there are orders of angels. There are hierarchies of angels and these four living beings are the angels that are closest to the throne. The Bible describes them as cherubims. Cherubims, and we'll talk about their role throughout the Bible, but these particular angels now are in heaven, but their activity as guided by the Spirit is on earth. And these angels are carrying out the will of God on earth and superintending what happened. But let me tell you something else. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4 that these had the appearance of burnished bronze. What did we say bronze represented? Eyes like fire, feet like what? Bronze. What does that represent? Judgment. When you flip over to chapter 6, these four living beings are going to be the ones saying it's time for judgment on the earth we see that there are four of them let's turn to revelation and let's let's look up look a little bit more at these four living beings which are angels revelation we're back in revelation chapter four but i want to look at revelation seven chapter seven and verse number one let's look at the number four now there are four of them and the number four most times refers to all of God's creation. Just read through the first verse of Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw how many? Four angels standing at the what? Four corners of the earth holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. That number four is speaking to all of God's creation. But not only that, we said that these four living beings are the only ones that are described as being in the throne and around the throne. The saints of God, the rapture church, around the throne. We'll see in chapter 5 that the rest of the angels around the throne. But they almost have special access to the glory of God. They are closest to the glory of God. There are four of them. But there was another one. If you turn to Ezekiel chapter 28, and let's begin at verse number 11. Listen to God speak to the king of Tyre, but he's not just speaking to the king of Tyre, but he's speaking to the one that he's representing. And look at verse number 11 of Ezekiel chapter 28 look at what he says again the word of the Lord came to me saying son of man take up a lamentation a sad story a sad song over the king of Tyre and say to him thus says the Lord God listen to what he says you had the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty you were in Eden the garden of God Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, and the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you on the day that you were created. They were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire, just like those other four. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until, somebody say until, unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. Who is he talking about? Satan. Satan 
was one of the most privileged of all the angels right there closest to the glory of God well that that's we've always said that God will not share his glory with somebody else and Satan, Lucifer, that son of the morning who was right there around the throne and, and he was supposed to reflect the glory of God, which we're going to see. That's what these angels were doing. They were reflecting his glory and, 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 and to honor him. But instead, he started looking at it and said, well, I look kind of good too. Look, and, and I should receive some of this praise that's going toward this throne. And let me tell you something. You, you know it, but he was so persuasive that he got 33.3% of the angels to follow him. Let me tell you something. Don't be like those angels. Those angels could only see the one that the glory was supposed to reflect through instead of seeing the one who was supposed to receive the glory. And I say it here on tonight, when it comes to pastors and when it comes to uh, worship leaders and ministry leaders, whoever is leading, you got to look beyond the one who is leading to the one who's leading them. Because ultimately, all the glory belongs to the Lord. And whoever God uses to reflect his glory, all of the honor and all of the praise belongs to the Lord. And so we see here on tonight that he was one of them. But we look again at these creatures. Now, somebody's probably asking, what, what the hell are those eyes for? Watching everything. Now, they're not all knowing. They're created. They don't know everything. But all of those eyes, it says the eyes were outside all around them and within. It speaks to their awareness. They are aware, they're so aware of what is needed to carry out their duties. It also speaks to their wisdom and their knowledge. Remember what he said, we said to the king of Tyre, which was, who was personified as Satan, as Lucifer. He said, that you, you had wisdom and beauty. They, they are wise. They are the wisest of the angels. They, they have this knowledge. And, and these eyes also reflect something about God because this is the thing why did God make us what for to glorify himself when, when God when God said let us make man in our what own image that tells us right there that God put something in us when he made us that says something good about him and he creates these beings, these angelic beings, to glorify him as well. And so, they, they, as they are made with all these eyes, it ought to tell us something about God. That God sees everything. They, they reflect the glory of God. They don't know it all, but they, the way they are made shows that there's somebody who does know it all. And according to David in Psalm 139, he knows when we stand up. He knows when we sit down. He knows what we're going to say before we even say it. And as a matter of fact, he said, where can you go where you could get away from his spirit? Where, where can you go to where God can't see you and where, where God won't be there? And so we, we see this here that they're full of eyes. But let's look at them again. They're full of eyes. But then the Bible says one of them looked like a lion. One looked like a calf, one looked like a man, and one looked like a flying eagle. Now, Ezekiel says each of them had the face of a man, a bull, or an ox, or a calf, a bovine animal, a man, a bull, an eagle, and a lion. So, on, on the four, you just think of four sides of that face. Bull, man, lion, and then eagle. Each of them had all four within their face. When John saw them, he saw each of them from one side. Now, this, the way he made these four living beings who, who are 
obviously made to reflect his glory, uh, which we see by their proximity to his glory. They're the closest of anybody to the throne. And he created these angels to reflect his glory and to be in close proximity to his glory. But even the way their faces look say something about who God is. What do you think about? You think of a lion. All right, somebody say the lion of the tribe of Judah. Is a lion a weakling? A strong. A lion speaks to his strength. What do you think about? You think about an ox. He's strong. What, what, what does he normally do? What is the ox doing? Carrying a load. The ox is one of the, one of the animals that's, that we see as, as one who, who serves. What do you think about the man? When, when God made, made it, all his creation, yeah, when he made his creation, he made the fish, he made the birds, he made all these different animals and he said they were good but when he made man he said he what very good the highest of all created that, that, that he made and that man speaks to the face of the man speaks to wisdom reason part of what it means to be made in the image of God is we're not just a wild animal just doing whatever we have reason we, we, have, we, have, we have wisdom and then the eagle speaks to the speed but there's more to say about that because heaven is a place of what? Grace. We receive the grace of God through who? Jesus Christ. We said at the beginning of this Bible study that wherever there is grace, there will be gratitude. And wherever there is gratitude, there will be glory to him. These four different faces actually represent, among other things, the four different portraits that we have of Jesus Christ. How many Gospels are there? How many? How many? Four. <laughs> four, four. Matthew? Mark, Luke, and John. Each one of them show us a different facet, facet like a diamond, a different facet, or a word that's within that word facet, a different face of Jesus Christ. Matthew shows him, somebody already got it, shows Jesus Christ as king the king of kings and the lord of lords matthew starts off his gospel by saying jesus christ the son of david the son of abraham and in matthew's gospel you see over and over again the words so that it might be fulfilled so that it might be fulfilled he's saying this is your king He's the king. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Matthew is saying that this is the one who is born king. He's, he, he came here as king. Most times a king is not born. He's born a prince. And then he becomes a king. But this is the one who is born king. When Pilate asked Jesus, he said, are you a king? Jesus said, it is as you have said. But he said, my kingdom is not of this world. He is seen as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Which face is that reflected on, on those angelic beings? Well, there was a tribe. And that tribe was the tribe of Judah. And in one particular scripture, he said, the scepter or what belongs to the king will not depart from Judah. Then he goes on to say, and we'll see it in chapter 5, the lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus Christ. Who's the king of the jungle? That's an easy way to remember. The lion. And so we see that Matthew presents him as king, and in Revelation we see him as a lion, reflecting him as a lion. What's the next gospel? What comes after Matthew? Mark. Mark presents him as the suffering servant. 
And so when you read the gospel of Mark, you read it, you're going to see over and over again the word straightway. Straightway, which if you read it in the NASB, it's immediately, immediately. You see Jesus going from one thing to the next. And straightway, he went to Capernaum. And straightway, he went to another city. And straightway, because Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And so he's the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He's the one who came to serve. He's the one who said the greatest among you will be your servant. Now a lion is a king, but that ox is a servant. As a matter of fact, when you look throughout the Bible and it talks about an ox, talks about that cow. You see it as a servant. That's why I said, don't muzzle the ox as he treads out, as he serves, as he, as he works. And so the first face we see reflecting the royalty of the kingship of Jesus Christ. The second face we see in that ox or that bull just being a servant like Jesus was. But then we saw that there was the face of a man. What's the next gospel? Luke presents him as the son of man, the son of man. So Matthew presents him as king. Mark presents him as servant. Luke presents him as the son of man, which is why when Luke begins, you, you see the most extensive recording of his birth. You see uh, the most extensive uh, talking about him as a, as a little kid and, and seeing that he's not just the son of God, he's the son of man. This is good news on today that Jesus is the son of man. That, that he's not just God that's just up there that doesn't understand what it is to go through tough times, but that he's one who can be touched with our infirmities. That he's experienced everything that we can experience, but the Bible said with one caveat, yet without what? Sin. Never sin. He overcome. And so we see now the face of the lion, the king. We see the face of the bull of the ox, the servant. That's Mark. King is Matthew. We see the face of the man who is Luke presents him as the, the son of man, which is the face of the man. And that got one more face left, and that's the face of the flying eagle. Now, interestingly enough, the last gospel, which is John, presents him as the son of who? God. John doesn't start off by saying the son of David, the son of Abraham. He doesn't start off by saying the birth of Jesus was on this wise. He starts off by saying in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. He's saying Jesus is the son of God. Now, interesting now, an ox, an ox does his work on the ground. One thing about an eagle is you don't find too many animals that are higher than an eagle. And so when he says that's the face of an eagle, he's saying he is the exalted son of God. And these these angelic beings are not just looking the way that they are looking just to look good. They are looking the way that they are looking to make Jesus look good. And it's the same for us, that whatever we do, however he made us, we don't have a bunch of eyes and, and we don't have wheels under us and we don't have all of this stuff, but we do have souls that have been saved. We do have lips that can give praise to him and hands that can clap and feet that can go and do his service. And so we see these and now we see that they are there. They have all these eyes. Uh, they are reflecting the glory of God. And the Bible says in the four living creatures, verse number eight, Revelation four, each one of them having six wings. Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah six. Almost done for tonight. Isaiah chapter six. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1, starting verse number 1, 
It says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, this is Isaiah, he says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Verse number two, seraphim stood above him, each having what? Six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Verse number three, and one called out to another and said, what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Many commentators believe that the cherubim and the seraphim are interchangeable. Seraphim means burning one. And you remember, these four living beings are darting back and forth in the midst of the fire and in the midst of the lightning and the thunder. And the Bible says they have six wings and they are saying back and forth to one another what? They got out their hymn book and they didn't have to turn far. The hymn number one. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. The Bible says that they're saying it one to another, back and forth, one to another, which leads us to say this on tonight. This gives us a pattern for praise. Our praise is not complete until we share it with somebody else. Boy, in prayer meeting on tonight, one of our sisters said, I, if I'm saved, I just have to say something. I have to say how good God has been to me. And you think about it, anything that we really want to praise, we tell somebody about it. I'm looking at little Dolby, Dolby breaking records out there uh, at track and field in Lakeland. And, and, and listen, when I want to tell somebody, I can't just keep it to myself. Say, y'all heard what Dolby doing out there? When, 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 uh, when in high school, when I saw Rashida, I didn't just keep it to myself. I had to tell them, you see Rashida? Right? Or, 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 uh, when the basketball game when LeBron James had 20 and 20 it, nobody just watched that and said oh he had 20 and 20 if there's somebody else that's interested in that guess what you seen LeBron last night what are they doing sharing their praise or whatever it is they want to praise but what nobody deserves to be praised more than Jesus Christ and that's why when we come together, we, we, don't, we shouldn't just hold it to ourselves. That's the strength in coming to church. Because listen, I may not have a praise immediately, but when I hear yours, and I hear somebody else say, he's been good to me, it ought to trigger something in me to say, you know what, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Fire your shut up. And so, and so they're sharing it. Oh, boy. I want you to see something. When they started sharing it with one another, it became a heavenly angelic quartet. They're sharing it in verse number eight, but look at verse number 10. Then the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and represent the rapture church and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne and they're gonna praise God. I'm perfectly like getting into what they're saying yet. But I want you to see it started with four. Now you have more. Skip down to Revelation chapter 5, verse number 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And they are praised. And I want you to see how it continued to grow. Started with those who were closest to the throne. And those who were closest to God's throne began to share it with one another. And as they shared it with one another, those who were a little bit further out began to praise him. And then before you knew it, all of the angels were praising him. And before you knew it, people began to pick up harps as you'll see in, in, in chapter number five. And this praise is growing until one day it fills the whole earth. And everyone is praising the Lord. Well, we'll end with this and I'm done. Verse number eight, these living creatures with all these eyes, the Bible says they do not cease to say 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. If we want to praise like they do in heaven, I want to give you four reasons why you ought to praise God based simply of what we see them doing around the throne. One, praise God because of his purity. His purity. The Bible says he's holy and he's so holy we got to say it three times. Holy, holy, holy. He is not like us. He is set apart. He is pure. He is perfect. Secondly, praise him because of his position. He is the Lord God. He is the Lord God. Is it he that has made us and not we ourselves? Satan got that twisted and that's how he got thrown out. The proper response from a creature to a creator is worship. Praise him, one, because of his purity, two, because of his position, three, because of his power. Listen to what they say, and they don't stop saying it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the almighty. The almighty. And then lastly, you want to praise like they're praising in heaven. Praise him because of his permanence. Look at how he is described. He who was and who is and who is to come. That covers it all. He is from everlasting to everlasting. And that's how they praise him. And we will see that this is one of 14 doxologies in the book of Revelation we look at that heavenly praise and the more our praise matches heaven's praise the more pleased God will be with what we say amen 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 well there's a lot in there and there's a lot that I probably did not cover uh, that's there but any comments or questions on tonight Brother Davis talked about Lucifer and uh e Ezekiel is one in Isaiah 2, uh, the 14th mm -hmm. chapter. It's, it's a little bit more vivid text. Uh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, in Isaiah, that's when we heard those, those uh, words that really sunk Lucifer's ship. I will. He kept saying it over and over. I will ascend. I will. I will. Instead of what God is doing is what he wanted to do. Yeah, he wanted to be in charge. He wanted to be to receive that glory. And listen, that spirit is still working in the world. Amen. Don't be like that. Amen. Sister Simpkins. I just wanted to make an observation about the eagle. I can remember. Um, early in my career at the city when there was a development that was going to be um, somewhere I believe it was um, in North Lakeland somewhere I can't remember the exact location and because an eagle had um, nested there it had they put a halt to it and one of my supervisors who who was a believer she basically had to break it down as to why development couldn't move forward because the eagle wasn't there at the time, but it had nested there before, that that eagle often comes back for um, a re-nesting. You know, you, so it's just because it's not there today, it will come back year after year after year. So there has to be a statue of, of them proceeding. I say all that to say that the eagle and reminds me so much, well, I would say, the eagle is symbolic of Christ. It has so many characteristics of Christ, the vision, um, just that it returns to its nest, like Jesus comes back for us. It just has so many mm -hmm. characteristics of Christ, and that's why of all those four creatures, I, I, I like the eagle. I mean, the other ones are uh, strong as well, but that eagle and what it stands for to us are United States bird, you know. So that's that's my observation about the eagle. Amen. Amen. Those eagles are majestic animals. And uh, I, I tell you what, you, we can learn so much. I love to just watch the nature channel. 
is watch the animals and watch, watch them do things like take care of their kids. Watch them do things like protect their loved ones, you know, um, just innately. And learn a lot about God just by looking at his creation. Amen. Reverend Love it. at least 700 feet from that nest. Over to the mine for a while, and there'd be at least 700 feet before that, from the nest, for the mine. You could mine, but the 700 feet, you could mine to the, yeah, 700 feet. Mm. We know the eagle is a protected species in, in our nation because of what it represents. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let, on, on the handout, so number one. <laughs> you saw who asked that question. <laughs> number one is the summons. The summons. Like if you receive a summons to jury duty, do you not go? You go, right? So yeah, the summons, come on up here. The second is the sovereignty, talking about the throne, which is prominent and preeminent and permanent there in heaven. The scene is number three. The scene, we see this crystal, we see this rainbow, this thunder and this lightning. And just imagine that, thunder and lightning and a rainbow in the same scene. Then we see the saints, that's Roman number number four which is rep representative of the entire raptured church. Remember chapters two and three, the church age, um, a ch chapter number four, a raptured church in heaven, who has, as one commentator puts it, been coronated. They have received their crowns. Um, number five is the sound, the sound. And that sound that we were talking about was the, the thunder. Number six is the spirit, the spirit before the throne, the seven spirits of God. And then number seven, which we spent uh, the rest of that particular passage looking at is the symbolism, the symbolism. And in particular, those four living beings who are angelic beings. <laughs> Your uh, Reverend Davis said, remember you living with a school teacher. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anybody else? chapter, you know, in uh, verse 3 and three and 4, I'd like to share with the church. And he says here, he's, he's in God's excellent name. And he says here, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest? his omniscience and the power of God that how he just loves us so much amen amen I, I agree sentiment of David who am I what is my house that you brought me this far amen and that's how we'll be in heaven perpetually eternally amazed that God brought us to that place Amen. Amen. Maybe there's someone here or watching virtually. You may watch this years from now. You are not saved. You are not saved. We've been talking about the throne room of heaven. There is one way to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you are not saved, the Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the everlasting life takes place in a place called heaven that we've been talking about. Maybe you're here on tonight or watching virtually and you're in need of a church home. The Spirit of the Lord is leading you to join with this fellowship. Our doors are open. The Lord's church, his word, his glory, we're his people are seeking to grow closer to him through his word, through worship, and be better witnesses for him. If that's you. The doors are open. Maybe you're here on tonight or watching virtually and you backslidden. You're on your way to heaven, but you're not walking in that way. The Bible says the Lord is married to the backslider. He's waiting on you to come back to him like the prodigal son. You ought to come to yourself. Come back home to a good and loving father who will never leave you nor forsake you. If you are in need of responding to any of those three invitations, to Christ, to church, or to change, if you are here tonight. Would you stand if you need to respond to any of those invitations on tonight? you're watching virtually you can comment or inbox contact the church office if you need to respond to any of those three invitations amen amen again it's so good to see everyone on tonight and um, from the wonderful prayer meeting um, that really got gets things started for me I love to hear saints praying and praising God it does something for me and I'm very thankful for that time and um, our time that we had together in the word I want to tell you on tonight that on this upcoming Sunday following worship service we are rededicating the house uh, which is really a, a center of community engagement and outreach and um, it is will be called home the house of mission and evangelism Looking forward to seeing everyone um, this Sunday as we go and just rededicate it to the Lord. It was, uh, we were ready to go from what I understand. And then the pandemic came, and so we had to put it on pause. But the lead is not denied, amen? And many people are going to be helped and aided through what God wants to do uh, through that place. And so on Sunday, after service, we look forward to that. Also, if you desire to, uh, Sunday, I'm going to dress down and be a dress down Sunday if you want to dress down or if you want to dress up that's alright um, but I'll be dressed down and if you want to wear your church t-shirt or another dress down item um, that's fine just remember um, when we dress down we still want to be respectful amen amen when dress down don't mean coming looking like you're in the garden of Eden just a leaf <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, leave there. Still want to be respectful. And so, um, amen. It looks like the young people are coming in, so I'll wait for them to come on in. Amen. Amen. S Sister Salvin. <laughs> Y'all come on, tell them to come on in. Oh, yeah, and all of our teachers. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We thank God for all of our teachers. They don't have an easy job, do they? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We thank God for them on the front lines um, of education and service. Amen. Amen. All right, let us stand. Reverend David said he need to pay him more money. I agree. Father God, we thank you so much for this time you granted us together. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness. We thank you for uh, the light that you give us through your word. We pray, Father God, that your word will continue to transform us from the inside out. We thank you for the hope of heaven. And we thank you for your spirit as that down payment, uh, letting us know where we are going. We ask, Lord, to continue to bless this church. Keep her, bless her, lead her uh, by your spirit. We love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Everyone have a wonderful Wednesday.